You're able. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? His love's mighty, so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth, holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That He would take my place. That He would bear my cross. That He would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Back into order, who makes the orphan, the son and daughter, the king of glory, the king above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the king of glory, the king above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you lay down your life. That I would be set free. Joy is so sinful. All that you've done for me. Amazing grace, this is a failing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, that you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. She muted me, and I haven't even said anything yet. Oh, man. Hey, doesn't the band sound good? Get, yeah. Get some of the dead weight out of there, and they start sounding really good. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of things coming up here. The first things first, the harvest party, we're going to be having that. It's going to be on a Saturday this year. It has been on a Friday for the last couple of years, but it's going to be on a Saturday, so it's going to start at 6.30, and we are in need of volunteers. We have a video of what it would look like if nobody signed up to volunteer, so before I pass these out, I want to show that.
I love watching those mob movies like uh, The Godfather, stuff like that. And I think maybe I've watched too many with Callie in the room because <laughs> <laughs> they come to me and ask for a favor on Halloween. So if uh, we have uh, sign-up sheets that are going to be going around, if you will... If you want to volunteer for one of the games, then sign on the orange sheet. And there are a couple of different colors on there. There's also a sheet where you can sign up to donate candy. There's another sheet where you can sign up to donate prizes for everything that's going on. Last year, I know that we use a lot of Methodist math around here. And by that, I mean if people slow down long enough to read the sign, we count them in our attendance. But last year... Um, we had 1,500 sign-up cards, and we used every one of them, and more people came after we ran out of sign-up cards. So there were more than 1,500 kids here, so we need a lot of, a lot of extra help. So um, you can sign up. You can either sign up to do all night. It's only two hours if you do the whole thing, or you can just sign up to do an hour. But we need people to do that. And it's just like everything else that we do here. Uh, the, every year when we do the harvest party, this is one of the biggest things that we do. We always get people from all over the area that come, and they bring their kids because there's so much free candy, and the whole thing's free. Uh, all you got to do is show up, and your kids can just eat themselves sick. And um, we always end up having somebody that says, man, that church seems really cool. Maybe we should go back and try it out on Sunday morning. Every single year, we get one or two families that start coming to church here because of the harvest party, and we can't do that unless we all volunteer. So uh, if you are available on October 26th, please sign up in some capacity. Um, let's see. Next thing, baptisms are going to be coming up on the 13th. Um, so again, if you want to be baptized, I know we have a couple of people in this service that have already talked to me. If you want to be baptized, let me know after service and we'll be sure and get you on the list for that. Um, let's see. Then we got a movie night coming up. Uh, it, it's a movie. It's a baseball movie, so I'm really excited about that. It's based on a true story. It's called The Hill, and that is not a typo. They are going to be showing it on Friday and Saturday night next week. So whole thing's free. It is to support the men's ministry, so you can bring your own snacks if you want, but they will be selling concessions, and the money that they make on the concessions is going to go to support the men's ministry. So that is going to be coming up next Friday and Saturday night. And then... Let's see. One last thing. Uh, our SPR chair, Karen Finstermacher, is here to share something with us. So. Don't clap for her yet. You don't know what she's going to say. <laughs> Good evening, you guys. Can you hear me? Like this? Talk like this? Oh, okay. Um, the reason I'm here is two things. One is to remind everybody that October is Pastor Appreciation Month here, and we are so blessed to have pastors that are Bible-believing and teaching and preaching. We are so blessed for that. And so what we're going to do is here along that hall, I mean that wall over there, there will be tables that have boxes for each of our pastors and the other ministers, music ministry and children's ministry, that sort of thing. Um, and they'll be up for the whole month of October. And what we are asking from SPR is that everybody would just take time to write a note to the pastors telling them how much you appreciate them, whatever it is that you want to say, and you can drop it in the box. Chris this morning also said he appreciated bean dip. So little, I mean, if you've got little gifts for someone that you want to do, that's also fine. We're just encouraging acknowledgement just as an encouragement to the pastors. And then the other thing I'm here is to let everybody know that, for I don't know how many of you all know, years ago, back in the early 2000s, we were doing mission trips to Jamaica, Bama, Jamaica, and we're going to do it again next March, the 22nd to the 30th. And so anyone who is interested in going, just reach out and get in touch with me. Um, it is Part of it's going to be medical at the clinic. Um, you don't have to be a medical person to go because we need everybody involved. If you can count to 90, you can work in the pharmacy. Um, and you can help in the kitchen, depending on how many go from the team, what the breakout is. Uh, we may do minor construction, and by minor, I mean 
minor construction. It's not like building things that you have to be a construction person to be able to do. But um, just reach out to me if you have any questions on that, and I'll be glad to fill you in. Thanks. <laughs> okay, in our prayer time tonight, uh, first things first, we have a praise. This is where I was last week. Jo Johanna Kissling and Carter Hearn. Uh, Carter has been a part of this church what, since he was a baby? Carter's grown up here. Yeah, the, the parents of the groom are here tonight. Uh, Carter and Johanna got married last Sunday night, and so that is a big praise. And then we've had a couple of people in the hospital this week. Jim Owen, who has been in the hospital um, kind of off and on for a while, he is on hospice now, so uh, Jim is not doing very well. And then Sharon Rogers um, and... We do have to point this out, the elder Sharon Rogers, because two generations of Rogers go here, and Bud and Scott both married a woman named Sharon. So uh, the elder Sharon Rogers, she, is, she has been dealing with a lot of illness lately and would like prayer. And then Bob Warden. Uh, a lot of you guys probably know Bob because the Wardens, a lot of times when Bob was able to get out, they would come to this service pretty often, but Bob is, uh, Bob has not been doing very good. So uh, his wife called and asked if we would pray for him. So uh, keep Bob in your prayers. And then Phyllis Chastain, another person who has been a part of this service when she is feeling well. Phyllis was in the hospital. She is home now, but Phyllis was in the hospital this week. So um, Oh, one more thing, and I, normally I don't point this out, but a lot of times he comes to this service too. Grant Quinley, a lot of you guys know Grant. Grant joined the church this, this morning, so when you see Grant next week, be sure and congratulate him and, and welcome him to the family. So let's pray. God, it's always so good to be in your house, and we thank you for this time that you have set aside for us every week. We thank you that we can come here and... Just enjoy each other's company and enjoy being around people that point us to you. People that lift us up and encourage us. And God, we thank you that you've given us a family that is centered on you. So that we can come here every week and we can get re-centered. God, we do have a very long list of people that can't be here this week because of health reasons especially and God every one of them we lift up to you whether they're on the list or it's just people that are dealing with any sort of illness or so many spiritual battles that seem to come up right as we're leaving to come to church every week God we have so many things that want to draw us away from you we have distractions from the world. We have spiritual attacks that, that come up and they get in the way of us spending time with you, spending time in prayer, spending time with our church family. We have illness that is just part of being alive that we have to deal with. And we have some people that have been a part of this service for a very long time that are coming near the end of their lives. And God, that's always a very difficult thing. And we ask for every one of these people, whether they're on this list tonight or not, that you would intervene in their lives and that they would feel your presence. And God, for every one of these people, we ask for total healing. And we know that you're capable of that, but we know that that's not always your will. And God, we know that that's okay because your will is always good. So with every one of these prayer concerns tonight, we ask that your will would be done. And we thank you that even when your will is not what we want, we can know that it's good because we have a hope that one day all of the things that we deal with in this life will be a distant memory. But God, until that day, we thank you that we have times like this and we have things that we can celebrate like a marriage and a growing family 
both the growing family for the Hearns and for this church because we continue to have people that are drawn to this place. And it's not because of anything that we do, but it's because you are the one that is at the center of everything that this church does. So God, tonight we take this time that you have set aside that you have made available to us and we worship and praise you and we ask that everything that we do would be pleasing to you because God we come to your house tonight to honor you and we ask that when we leave here tonight every one of us is recharged and refreshed and renewed to go out and share the good news that we celebrate here tonight with people that desperately need to hear it God, we thank you for all of these opportunities tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and join in worship. Search the world, it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and the treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, put me back together. And every desire. God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. searching for different things in our life, right? Nothing fills with Jesus. Worthy of every 
every song I can ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we can ever bring. Worthy of every breath we can ever breathe. We live for you. Live for you. Worthy of every song. Let's sing it again. Worthy of every song we can ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we can ever bring. Worthy of every breath we can ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me And
Please be seated. Life is all about perspectives. And every time I hear that word, I, when I was in high school and college especially, I was a Saturday Night Live junkie. I loved watching Saturday Night Live. I actually made a couple of audition tapes and sent it to Saturday Night Live. I never heard back from them, but uh, anytime I hear that, there was a fake, you know, they always have like fake TV shows and stuff like that on Saturday Night Live. There was one of those uh, CNBC talking head shows, it was a fake one, and it was called Perspectives with Lionel Osborne. And I looked for a clip of that, I couldn't find one, I couldn't believe it. I found a lot of still shots, but since I couldn't find a clip, what I thought I would do is spend the next 10 minutes just acting out all the parts for you from memory. Doesn't that sound awful? (laughs) There was a lot of really uncomfortable laughter when I said that. Uh, From my perspective, that would be hilarious. From everybody else's perspective, maybe not. So, um, you know, perspective makes a big difference. Some people think... uh, Some people think that being a little overweight is a problem, but if you put it into perspective and consider Newton's universal law of gravity, the larger the object, the more attraction it has. So the bigger you are, the more attractive you are. That's the way I choose to look at it. So perspective, uh, it can change the way you view things. And I bring all this up because... um, Actually, I meant to thank Shannon for filling in for me last week because he did a terrific job. So, yeah. And when you see him coming out tonight, be sure and tell him again that he did a great job because he's up volunteering with the youth. But um, the, the last week that I was here, I focused pretty heavily on a, a teaching from Jesus from Matthew's gospel. And tonight we're going to focus pretty heavily on the same teaching, but from a different perspective, because Luke gives us uh, the, a different version of the same story. So Matthew wrote his gospel of Jesus's life, and gospel literally means the good news. When you hear the word gospel, that is kind of a transliteration of a Greek word that means the good news. So the good news of Jesus's life and ministry, and and Matthew wrote that somewhere between 50 and 60 AD, so pretty shortly after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. So uh, all three of the first three gospels say, essentially, these are the things that happened, And if you need more evidence, just go ask all the people that are mentioned by name because they're all still alive and they're all still in Jerusalem and they'd be happy to tell you this story themselves. Um, Matthew, though, wrote his gospel to his fellow Jews in Jerusalem to prove through his eyewitness account the messianic nature of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and Matthew is telling his fellow Jews, I saw it with my own eyes. This proves that he is the Messiah that we've been looking for for the last several hundred years, and I want everybody that will listen to know it. Luke was a little bit different. Luke wrote his gospel approximately 10 years later, and Luke was not a Jew. Luke was from, he was was a Greek person. He had no background in Judaism, and he didn't see anything that Jesus did. He didn't hear anything that Jesus said. But Luke was a physician and a historian, and he very meticulously pieced together these things that uh, happened in Jesus' life. And his purpose for writing his gospel account of Jesus' life Um, First and foremost, he's writing it as a letter to his friend Theophilus, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. It is sent to his friend Theophilus. We don't really know who this person is. It's really not important, but he wants to tell his friend Theophilus about the teachings and the work of Jesus who is able to save a Gentile like him. The compassion of Jesus. Luke's gospel is sometimes called the compassion gospel because it tells... uh, a lot of stories about Jesus' intimate involvement with people that you don't see in the other Gospels. So he did this very meticulously. And just to kind of refresh your memory, because I know it's been two weeks, and I have trouble remembering what I did this morning, let alone two weeks ago. But we focused pretty heavily a couple of weeks ago on Matthew 16 when Jesus says this. 
in verse 21. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised back to life. And when he did this, Peter, and remember, he has just told Peter, Peter, you have this special insight into who I am. The only way that you know that I'm the Son of God is because God the Father has revealed that to you. And your name is no longer Simon, now your name is Peter, because you're the rock that I'm going to build my church on. And then he goes on and he says, and and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be turned over, and they're going to put me in some kangaroo court trial, and they're going to execute me. And Peter stands up and he goes, no, 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 Jesus, we would never let that happen to you. We'll stop them. And Jesus turns to Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then this is what we focus on. Jesus says to all of his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross every day. And if you want to keep your life, you have to lose it. That's a hard thing to understand. Like these guys, when Jesus said it to them, they struggled with it because that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. 2,000 years later, we still struggle with that. To save your eternal soul, you have to give up your entire life to Jesus and his ministry of redemption. And Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the entire world but you lose your soul? Everything here is temporary. What good is it to gain temporary happiness and lose eternity? You know, we tend to think that this life is all that there is and that we have to squeeze every drop of joy out of every second that we can. And Jesus is actually pretty okay with that because he says, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. I don't want you to be beat up and scared and, and really just kind of beat down all the time. I want your life to be full, and I want it to be full of joy, and I want you to to be excited to wake up every morning. And the best way to do that, the fullest life we can live, is one that's service to his kingdom. And he asked whether we're prepared to give up our time and our talents and our gifts. And yeah, everything that we, if you're a member of this church, everything that is in the membership vows. Are you willing to give up your time and your talent and your gifts and your prayers? For the, for the good of the ministry? Or do you want to keep those things to yourself? Now let's look at how Luke tells this story. In Luke 14, he says, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brother, his sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person can't be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's a little bit different context than what Matthew says, isn't it? Sounds a little bit different. And it's it's because it is. Actually, Matthew or Luke 9, Luke 9 is where you will find this story of Jesus telling his disciples, you have to carry your cross and follow me every day. In Luke 9, 23, he says, Then he said to some of them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up his cross daily, follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their very soul? So you see how this sounds almost exactly like what's happening in Matthew's account. I wonder if Luke didn't interview Peter on this whole event, because you notice that whole get behind me Satan thing is left out. But but I think it sheds some light on the events. Jesus said this two times. Jesus doesn't just arbitrarily repeat things. He doesn't say things because uh, there might have been people that were there that day, and then a couple of days later, he has a different crowd, and he's like, I think these people need to hear this too. 
You don't see that in Jesus' teaching. If he says something, it's important, and he says it once. If Jesus repeats himself, then we all better pay attention. And in Luke's gospel, he says two times, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. And this second time in chapter 14 is a little bit more in depth, and you probably won't be surprised to find out that in Matthew 10, we find this account, maybe in a little bit more depth. In Matthew 10, 34, he says, Don't suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword, for I've come to turn man against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I don't think that one's that hard. Um, A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Father against son, mother against daughter, daughter mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. That's not the sweet and cuddly Jesus that we hear preached on TV, is it? Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. I'm going to separate you, I'm going to cause division. And that's all we hear on TV now is there needs to be unity and everybody needs to get along and respect each other's truth. That's how I hear it when those people say stuff like that. But... You know, that's, like I said, that's not sweet and cuddly Jesus. That's not that name it and claim it and all the other nonsense that these people preach on TV that is not really in keeping with what the Bible actually says about following Jesus. You know, I've seen horrible divisions in families before. I've seen the things that uh, this division that Jesus is talking about, I've seen the, thing, the way that plays out. And before we get into what that looks like, I want to talk a little bit about what it's not. It's not petty squabbling when you feel like somebody has disrespected you, or this is the saddest thing. Usually when a parent dies, the adult children start fighting over what little they have left. That's not the division that Jesus is talking about. It's not some stupid perceived slight, and it's not small-minded misunderstandings. Jesus didn't come to give you or your family members an excuse to act like jerks to each other. He didn't give any of us the, the ability or a reason to treat anybody badly. The thing that divides these families... Uh, both nuclear families and church families, is pride. I think I'm somebody and I think I deserve this and you don't recognize who I think I am and what it is that I think I deserve and it makes me mad. Pride will let you go for years, sometimes even decades, without speaking to a parent or a sibling or a child, you name it. Well, they did something and they hurt my feelings, so I'm not going to talk to them anymore. How stupid. Jesus is saying here in Matthew and Luke that this division that he's bringing is born out of the rage that is caused when somebody chooses to follow Jesus and a family member can't accept that. That's the sort of thing that I've, that I've seen and it's, I, I've seen it. I've had people tell me about it. I've experienced it myself. I've experienced what it's like to walk into a family gathering and have everybody suddenly get really quiet and start looking at their shoes because they don't really want to have you there to ruin their fun because one of those Jesus weirdos is going to kill the vibe. That is a lonely feeling. And I can tell you, and most of you guys know better than I do, that there is no greater pain than having to let a a family member or a close friend be cut out of your life because your faith and your relationship with Jesus is more important. When you have somebody in your life that has so much animosity towards Jesus that they can't bear to hear his name spoken. 
or to even be in the presence of somebody that is willing to follow him. That is, it, it's a weird thing because you, you, you understand that it's not you that they dislike. It's Jesus, but you're the one that bears the brunt of it. And that's a hard thing. And the hardest thing is we have to remember they can be as nasty as they want. But when they're being nasty to us, we're called to turn the other cheek and to pray for them. And sometimes that's really hard to do. But the fact remains, every one of us is going to be put in a position where we have to choose. Jesus or a person that's in our life. Do I compromise my beliefs and my salvation for this person that I love? Or do I pray for them from a distance sometimes? because I can no longer let them be a part of my life. Jesus says every one of us is going to have to make those choices. And the key is this. We never stop praying for those people. We never stop loving them. We don't have these people say nasty, mean things to us and about us and say, okay, I'm done with this person and I'm never going to talk to him again. You continue to pray for them. You continue to build those bridges. And I know that it's hard when it's a close family member, but that's what we're called to do. In Matthew 10, uh, when Jesus says that he's come to set family member against family member, he closes this out and he says, anyone that loves their father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And man, that's an impossible position to be in. Every summer, the youth goes to that conference in Colorado. It's called Lead the Cause. And one of the really key components of that conference is they want you to prayerfully be thinking about somebody in your life that doesn't know Jesus. And they have a a whole process that you go through. You send this person a text on the first night that you're there. You text this person, and you say something like, hey, I've been thinking about you a lot. What can I pray for you for? And you get varying responses. And then a couple of days later, you sit down, and you write out a full letter to this person, a handwritten letter, and you, you tell them everything. I want you to know Jesus. I'm worried about you. I love you. I know this is maybe not going to be great for our relationship, but I want you to know I love you more than the, the awkwardness that this is going to cause. And then the last night that you're there, you have to call that person. And that's terrifying. Because a lot of times the kids that are there are there for the first time and they don't know that they're going to have to do that. And all week long, they've been praying for and contacting a family member. I've seen these kids call their parents and try to share their faith with their parents and be rejected. I can't imagine that. To call your parents, the people that should love you more than anybody else in the world, and say, I want you to know Jesus the way that I do. And Some of these kids in our youth group I've had parents hang up on them. I've had them yell at them. I can't imagine what it would be like to go through that. And you might say it's not fair that we have to do those things. And it isn't. It isn't fair that we have to do those things. But we don't have a high priest that can't sympathize with us. Every temptation that any of us have ever been through... Everything that has caused us to suffer, Jesus has been through it himself. He's been through it in much worse ways than you and I can imagine. In Matthew 12, we see exactly this. We see that Jesus goes through this with his family members. In verse 47, it says, uh, Jesus is with his disciples after a confrontation with some Pharisees, and they're, they're, they're kind of away from everybody because... Um, it's exhausting 
when people are trying to argue with you and attack you because of your faith. So a lot of times Jesus would kind of retreat away and he would explain to his apostles, this is what happened, this is what I meant when I said this. And when he's in the middle of one of these explanations, it says someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak with you. And he says, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Jesus had several brothers, half-brothers. And most of them rejected him. They thought he was a crackpot. They thought he was nuts. They didn't want anything to do with his ministry. Jesus, you're ruining our family name. Stop going around and telling people you're the son of God because we know who you are. You're from Galilee and you're a carpenter. Would you stop with this nonsense? Look at what you're doing to mom. You're hurting mom's feelings. Jesus, they come and say, hey, your mother and your brother want to talk, brothers want to talk to you. They're standing outside and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? You people that want to do God's will, you people that want to advance the kingdom, you're my mother and my brothers. Whoever does, not, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And that's why family is so important. Yes, we're a family like a church family. I'm lucky. My immediate family, I don't, I don't have to deal with this stuff. My parents are here tonight. My wife and my kids are here tonight. But that's not true of most of the people that are here tonight. Your parents may not be here. Your spouse may not be here. Your kids may not be here. And some of you may be in a position where they don't want to talk to you because of that. That's exactly what Jesus is dealing with here. And that's why having a family like this is so important. That's why having a family of believers and being with your family of believers any chance that you can is so important. And yes, like I said, we will make mistakes. We will accidentally hurt each other's feelings. I have hurt people's feelings, and I feel terrible about it when I find out about it because it's never intentional. And I know that when you guys hurt somebody else's feelings in the church, it's not intentional, but sometimes it's hard to let those things go. It doesn't make the hurts diminish. You know, at least not right away. They don't ever go away, but they will will kind of fade away if you let it, if we bear with one another and do what Paul tells us to do, bear with one another, pray with one another, and lift each other up. And that sounds like a lot. Jesus brings a sword to cause division. He separates everything. He separates the wheat from the chaff, the lambs from the goats. Uh, he prunes. He says that a couple of times. I'm going to prune you, and he's using a sword to do it. That's not a very finely tuned instrument for pruning a vine, and it hurts. It hurts to have things cut out of our lives, with a sword especially, but here's the thing, you don't have to go through any of that. All this stuff that I've talked about, all this pain, all this division, you don't have to do any of that if you don't want to. And that's probably not going to be the good news that you're hoping it is, but it's your choice. If you choose not to go through these things, uh, you don't have to, but you're not going to find yourself in Jesus' presence. This is just part of it. If you don't allow him to be this dividing factor in your life that separates you from the world, from who you used to be, that separates you from your close family members if necessary, then you're not going to find yourself in his presence for eternity. You're going to be in that place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have a choice to make. And Jesus says that. He says, can you handle the burden of carrying your cross and following wherever he tells you to go? And it's a lot. And Jesus warns us, take stock of these things. Don't start out. Don't do it if you can't handle it. In Luke 14, when he says, I've come to set mother and brother against or mother and and father against son and daughter when he says that I'm bringing this division he goes on in verse 28 here this is Luke 14:28 he says suppose one of you wants to build a tower 
Won't you sit down first and estimate the cost and see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone will see it and ridicule you. They're all going to laugh at you. You don't start building a big project and then run out of money because you didn't sit down to make sure that you've got the money and the manpower to finish it. I've done that, but uh, it's... <laughs> It's a symptom of ADHD. I get things three-quarters of the way done, and then I just lose interest and move on. Aaron loves it. Um, he goes on, he says, Or suppose that a king's about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one that's coming against him with 20,000? Like, you don't just rush into battle and hope for the best. You check things out. You make sure that you're not outnumbered by 10,000 like this. You make sure you've got a chance to win because it's, uh, it's foolish to go rushing into battle and not know if you're going to survive or not. And to not know if once you get there and you see the odds are stacked against you that you're not going to try to turn around and run away. He says, if he's not able, will he send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace? Like, hey, I can't fight this fight. What do I have to do to make sure that you don't kill me? No one said that it's going to be easy. One of my favorite movies as a kid is a movie called The Untouchables. It's still one of my favorite movies. Um, it's a story about Elliot Ness, the, the federal agent who brought down Al Capone. It, it's a highly fictionalized account. Um, but Elliot Ness is... Uh, in, the, in the story... There are really only three characters that are real people, Elliot Ness, Al Capone, and then one of his underbosses. And uh, really, everybody else in the movie is just kind of a conglomeration of several real-life people that were part of this. And if you've seen the movie, it's really old. I looked it up. I think it was made in 1987. So it's really old, but if you've seen it, you know that Sean Connery's character is the best part of the movie. He's this tough-as-nails old Irish immigrant cop that is above reproach and he can't be bought and somehow by accident he gets connected with Elliot Ness and at the beginning of this mission Elliot Ness says I'm going to get Al Capone he is the he is the most evil bloodthirsty criminal that this country has probably ever seen he was a bad bad guy and when he's getting ready to get started he sits him down and he says you better take stock and I've got a video here it's a short video of the movie you said you wanted to know how to get Capone. Do you really want to get him? You see what I'm saying? What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? If you open the ball on these people, Mr. Nash, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they won't give up the fight until one of you is dead. I want to get Capone. I don't know how to get him. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That becomes kind of a theme throughout the movie, and Sean Connery says that several times. What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. Then what are you prepared to do? Because once you start this fight... You have to finish it. If you are going to pick up your cross and follow Jesus, he's saying very clearly, if you're going to follow me, you got to go all the way up to the top of the hill with me and you got to get nailed to the cross right next to me. If you're not going all the way, then don't even start. What are you prepared to do? And Jesus asks us the same thing as Sean Connery in a much less vengeful way in Luke 14 here. What are you prepared to do? Anything that I can do until it starts getting uncomfortable. Then what are you prepared to do? You know, in, in real life, Al Capone, he owned the police. He owned the courts. You couldn't trust anyone. He had sleeper agents all over the place. And that's really kind of the main thrust of the movie is you can't trust anybody except for these four guys, Elliot Ness and his three hand-picked guys. Jesus was the same way. You couldn't trust anybody except for Jesus and his 11 of his 12 hand-picked guys. 
And if you start this fight, that's what Sean Connery is telling him. If you start this fight, you better be prepared because he's going to hurt you in ways you can't imagine. He's going to try to kill your wife. He's going to try to kill your kids. He's going to defame you. He's going to embarrass you. He's going to do everything that he can. He's going to come for your job. He's going to come for your life. And if you think Al Capone, whose nickname was Scarface, he is the real Scarface, if you think he's a bad guy, and he was, I'm telling you that you have an enemy that is prowling around like a lion looking for who he can devour, and he wants to hurt you badly. And if you are going to fight against him, then what are you prepared to do? Are you prepared to go all the way? And he says in the movie, that's the Chicago way. They bring a knife, you bring a gun. They put one of yours in the hospital, you put one of theirs in the morgue. If they bring a knife, you pray for them. That's the Jesus way. They put one of yours in the hospital, you pray for them. They put one of yours in the morgue, celebrate because they've gone home. your closest friend or relative betrays you, you pray for him. You have to be prepared to give and to sacrifice because if you remember, this is what we talked about, Jesus is that treasure of immeasurable value. He's the pearl of great price. And if you want to have that, then you have to give everything to possess it. So what are you prepared to do? Are you prepared to sacrifice everything for that treasure? Everything, your, your relationships, your comfort, everything about your life. And I know it's scary, and it's just like in the movie. If you start, you have to be prepared to finish or you will die. You may live a very long life, but eventually you will die. So you have to be prepared if you're ready to to fight this fight. And I'm going to close with this. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says this in verse 17. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So if we fix our eyes, not on what's seen, but what's unseen, since what's seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. Lucky for us, Jesus is even tougher and more trustworthy than Sean Connery. (laughs) We please rise for the benediction. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, sharing with them all that I've given you, and surely I will be with you until the very end of the age. Amen.
Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.